All right. Well, we're going to be in Luke chapter 19 this morning. Luke chapter 19, verses 1 to 10. And we're continuing a series Pastor Zach started last week called Jesus at the Table. And we're talking about different encounters in the Gospels where Jesus sat at a table or in a household with people. And one of the things we learn is that uh, it's interesting to note that Jesus doesn't always choose the people that the religious people would choose for him to sit at the table with. And that's one of the things that we find out today. When you came in the door, you got a, uh, you got a pamphlet. Looks like this says Legacy Path uh, Israel. And it is the less strenuous tour that we'll be taking in uh, December. It'll be the first Israel uh, experience that we've done since the pandemic at that time. And we're really excited about it. I don't, I, I want you to know, I put this in your hand for one reason. This is by far the most fruitful discipleship endeavor I participate in uh, every year. And what I know is, I don't need to go to Israel anymore. I've, I've, I love it there, but I, I, don't, I don't need to see it. I've seen it. I don't go so I can see stuff. I go so people can learn what it means to understand the Eastern pictures of the biblical text so they can know Jesus more and walk with him. And this changes people's lives, this experience. It is a head, heart, hands, and feet experience. I just want you to have the opportunity to participate. If, you, uh, if you're thinking, I like the sound of less strenuous, uh, it's not non-strenuous, just to clarify. It's just less strenuous than that summer trip that we do. Uh, it's not, high, you know, climbing huge mountains or 10 or 12 miles of hiking a day, but it is, it is, you got to walk and there are hills there. And, uh, and it is, I have had once or twice on this less strenuous trip, someone walked up to me and said, this is not less strenuous. And, uh, to which I said, it is, you just, you just, you don't have the, the baseline baseline. So just, just know it's not non-strenuous, it's less strenuous, but the same kind of teaching, anybody can do this that wants to, to go and participate. Anybody can, can be a part of it. You can invite friends from outside of our church for sure. We always have people from all over the world, honestly, that come with us. And so, uh, but you're invited. I want you to know about it. And registration is now. We have, I think, nine people signed up. We also have a 2022 experience in June. That will be our, our, our strenuous tour. If we have a less strenuous, we must have a strenuous tour. And uh, there are already 23 or 22 people signed up for that one. So get on the list if you want to go. It, it is a big, big life change experience. Okay. So Luke chapter 19, 1 to 10, we're going to talk about the table of the lost today, the table of the lost. And to do that, we're going to talk about a guy named Zacchaeus. Uh, for those of you that grew up in church, you're already thinking a song. You're already singing in your head about a wee little man. For those of you that didn't grow up in church, you're like, who's that? Rumpelstiltskin? I don't, I don't know. Forget the wee little man, because this passage of scripture is actually not about Zacchaeus at all. It's about Jesus. And we find that in the last verse of the, of the 10, verse 10, that the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. So I'm going to ask you to stand with me. We're going to read this. And at the end of the main text reading, we say this phrase, the very words, just to distinguish God's word from my own. So I'll read this uh, for us. Luke 19.10. He entered Jericho, or 19, 1 to 10. He entered Jericho and was passing through. And there was a man named Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was rich. And he was seeking to see who Jesus was. But on account of the crowd, he could not because he was small of stature. So he ran on ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was about to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, Hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. So he hurried, and he came down and received him joyfully. And when they saw it, they all grumbled. He has gone to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. And Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, half of my goods I give to the poor, and if I've defrauded anyone or anything, I restore it fourfold. Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house 
since he also is a son of Abraham, for the son of man came to seek and to save the lost. It can be seated. How many of you have ever really been really lost? Like off the grid lost. Come on, raise your hand. Even if your wife, you know, raise your hand for your husband because he was admit, wouldn't admit that he was, he was lost, you know? I've been really, really lost a couple times in my life. The worst one that I can think of at the moment uh, was probably around 2008, 2009, uh, right when I started to lead these Israel trips. And uh, I had done a lot of training and, and, you know, knew the way, that kind of thing. But uh, we... We go to this place way south in the desert, almost on the Egyptian border called the Maktesh Ramon. It's, it's a big crater, huge crater. And uh, you cannot see from one side to the other of it. And it, it all looks the same. And there is not a drop of water nor a tree to find shade in this place. And so we, the way we do this, we know carrying water and we have about four hours of water. And after that, everyone dies eventually. And so we have to, we have to get in and out of there in, a, in that four hour window, which is the, the drill. And so back then, uh, before we had all this GPS and all this stuff on our phones, it was just landmarks, right? So you just look for landmarks. And I have particular landmarks that I was, I was lo- looking for now it's different. They have, they have painted landmarks for guys like me that have probably died out there with people for, you know, because they got lost or whatever. But I, I missed my landmark, right? So just put yourself in my shoes for a minute. 50 people following you through the desert. You have four hours and you don't know where you are. And everything looks the same. Any way you turn. And so I do what any good, you know, guide would do. I say, how many of you need a bathroom break? And they're all, I I do, I do. So spread out. And I find the tallest rock I can find. And I I skimmy up this rock as fast as I can go. And I know everybody's thinking, what is he doing? Do we wait here? You know, all of that kind of stuff. And I go and I'm looking for this landmark. And I'm looking for this landmark. And I realize like the landmark is behind me and way over there. So we have like, I've lost an hour, right? I got four hours of water. I got a four hour journey. I've lost an hour, which means what? Death. To some, to the, you know, to some of them, not all of them, some, some of them. And so uh, I'm trying to figure out what to do. I really am trying to figure out how to get back on, on course. And uh, I, I'm a little nervous. I'm a little scared. And uh, so I come back down the hill, and I don't want to tell these people we're lost, so I don't. I just, uh, I just start praying to the almighty God that we all believe in. Because he out there, he brought manna from heaven, water from a rock, shoes that wouldn't wear out. I'm like, do it again, Lord, do it again. And somehow we, we all made it out of there. But that feeling of being lost, especially lost with a group of people, was terrible. I mean, it was awful. And today, what we're going to talk about is the idea of lostness and how Jesus, Jesus runs to lostness. And so really, if you read the scriptures, what you'll find from beginning to end is that we are all living in a spiritual desert. And that in that desert, until we find Jesus, until Jesus finds us or, or comes to us and we have relationship with him, we, we, we place our trust and our faith in him, we follow him. Until then, we are lost in the desert, just like I was lost in the desert, only spiritually and only worse, right? And so <clears throat> here we find ourselves today in this passage of scripture that everybody wants the title, We Little Man, but... It's really about the son of man came to seek and to save the lost. And I I just want to talk through this historical narrative based on that last verse for the son of man came to seek and to save the lost. And I'll begin with the word came. The son of man came. Jesus came. Now, he's traveling from the north. If you read the text and kind of follow the breadcrumbs, he's traveling from the north 
to the south, and he's going to cut over to Jerusalem from Jericho. So he's, he's really walked through Galilee on the edge of the Samaria, Samaria, and he's walking along this great rift valley or the Jordan River Valley, this big crack in the earth, but it's a natural place to walk. And it is also a trade route. There's a huge trade route there. But when you get to Jericho, you, you, if you want to go to Jerusalem, you get to Jericho, you go for, there's a main road in the ancient days running from Jericho to Jerusalem and from Jerusalem to Jericho. And so if you're trading from the east, like from the King's Highway or the Nabataeans, anybody heard of the Nabataeans? Go Google it, my friends. Nabataeans. Um, really? No one? You need to come to Israel with me. Good. Um, <clears throat> so the, the Nabataeans, anybody heard of Petra and Jordan? Right? Raiders of the Lost Ark. Let me connect there, 1985. Um, <clears throat> All the goods coming from the east, if they wanted to go to Jerusalem, which is a major, major city where you're going to sell, you're going to come through Jericho to Jerusalem. It makes, Jer it makes Jericho a major thoroughfare in the ancient trade routes. It makes Jericho a great place to require taxation, toll, if you're wrong. Right, because Rome occupies the entire thing, and so Jericho is a major toll stop. It's significant, and everyone bringing goods to sell in Jerusalem, anywhere from the east, would be taxed in Jericho. Now, in that region, Zacchaeus, according to this passage of scripture, Zacchaeus was the chief tax collector. Right, this is the only person in all of the Gospels that is labeled chief tax collector. We have other tax collectors, but this is the chief tax collector. We don't really know how broad his, you know, his role spanned in the region. We don't know if it was just Jericho that he was chief over all the tax collectors in, in that region in the south, or if it was broader than that, but he is a chief tax collector. We're told two things about, three things about him. One, he's chief tax collector. Two, how many of you lo love taxes, by the way? All right. It's the same then. And then two, he is a wee little man. That is true. He, he, he has to climb up in a tree to, to get ahead of the crowd, above the crowd to see Jesus. And the other thing it tells us is that he was rich. He was rich. So who likes a rich tax collector? Does anybody know where the rich tax collector's money comes from? Well, the rich tax collector's money comes from, this is how it works. If you bring, if you come through Jerusalem, you have, I mean, through Jericho, you have nothing to sell. You still got to sort of pay the toll. But if you have stuff to sell, you got to pay taxes on all of your goods, your imports, your exports, depending on which way that you are going. And Rome sets the standard because Rome's in charge. Zacchaeus works for Rome, but he's a Jew. Okay, so, so his position then is if Rome says the tax is 14%, he's the chief tax collector, then, then he'll say, okay, all my tax collectors underneath me need, need a percentage, a cut of the tax. I got to pay Rome 14%. Of course, I need a cut, a bigger cut, because I'm the chief tax collector. And so maybe he makes it not 14%, maybe he says it's going to be 28%, and then he doles all the money out. So in effect, Zacchaeus has cheated everyone in that region. And everybody looks at him and sees this wee little man that is rich with their money. How many of you like Zacchaeus at this point? Come on. Uh, no, no one did. No one did. Not, not anybody in the, the crowd. And so, but Jesus, it says that Jesus came in this case, in this passage of scripture, he came to Jericho and, and, and eventually to Zacchaeus' house. Now, we do want to know one more thing about Zacchaeus from Luke 19, 1 to 4, and that is this, is that he hears that Jesus will be passing by and he is, Zacchaeus is seeking Jesus. He wants to see Jesus. So he does this thing where he climbs up in a sycamore tree. Now, if you're the richest guy around, are you going to run through a crowd and shimmy up a sycamore tree? Is that distinguished? Not even in the first century. And so we get this little pit, bit of information to help us understand that he is really adamant about seeing Jesus. He's seeking Jesus. And at the same time, Jesus is seeking Jesus. 
him. So here's what we find, Luke 19, 10, for the Son of Man, that's Jesus, came, he came now to Jericho here and particularly to Zacchaeus' his household to seek, to seek. And that is the, the second word that I, I want to talk about. So when Jesus passes by, if you go to verse 5 of, of Luke chapter 19, it says, and when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, he looked up because why Zacchaeus is in a tree, he looked up to him and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. Now, this is a big deal. This is a really big deal, especially in the East. It's not in the West. Like, if you find out one minute before that somebody's coming to your house, people are like, in the West, people are like, oh, this is horrible. You know, I, I don't have any food at my house right now, and I don't think we made the beds, and we're not ready for that right? In the East, it's an honor. And particularly, so it's an honor in two ways. One, Jesus looks up and, and says to Zacchaeus, he, he calls him by name, right? So it's possible that he knew who Zacchaeus was because Zacchaeus was known. He's the chief tax collector and he's a wee little man, which means he stands out. <laughs> the text just bangs on that stands out in two ways one he's a he's a person of prominence he has power nobody likes him and two he's small so everybody knows who he is in comparison and so jesus looks up and says to him zacchaeus today i must come to your house so it's an honor one that he he, he calls him by name and two that he says come down i'm going to your house i'm right here in jericho i could go to anybody's house in jericho uh but i'm gonna i'm gonna come to your house you got to think the crowd is like well what about the, the the chief rabbi in jericho what about the you know, the Pharisees in, in Jericho, why aren't you going to their house? Why are you going to this man's house? Jesus looked up at the tree. He was seeking Zacchaeus. Now, how do the people respond? I mean, just follow this. So Zacchaeus responds like, like this. So he hurried and came down and received him joyfully. I mean, this is, this is a big day for Zacchaeus. But when the crowd saw it, verse seven, and when they saw it, they all grumbled. And this is the quote. He has gone to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. He's gone to be the guest of a man who, ha who is a, a sinner. So who's in that crowd? Who's in that crowd in Jericho? Who, who, who are the people that are, find this deplorable or at least frustrating and are saying, why would he go to be, why would he go to, to be with a sinner? The, these are religious people, religious Jews. They know the Torah, the law. Uh, that's why they're asking themselves this question. Why is he going to the house of a sinner? Because if he goes there, he's on his way to Jerusalem. If he goes there, that's going to make him, guess what? Unclean. But he's on his way to Jerusalem where the temple is, where the presence of God. If you show up in Jerusalem, you want to show up there what? Clean. Why would you go, why would you go to this man's house? He's unclean. He, he, he is a chief sinner. And yet Jesus seems excited to go sit with this man who is the chief sinner in that particular region to be in his household. Well, wh why is that? B because he loves him. Because he loves him. Now, the people don't. The people do not. Who loves somebody who steals from you? The people do not love him. He, their gain, their loss is his gain. But Jesus, on the other hand, loves him. Zacchaeus is a thief. He's a rich thief. He's in cahoots with Rome. They, they, the people, they probably wanted a guy who would, a, a Messiah, who would execute guys like Zacchaeus in the name of justice because of the law. And now Jesus is going to sit at his table in his house. Why? Because Jesus came to seek and to save. Look at verse 8 and 9. And Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, behold, why, why did he stand? Probably because now they're at the house. Now they're seated at a table, which is exactly what would happen. They go in, washing takes place. They all gather at a table. Food and drink comes out instantly. I've seen it a million times. 
And Zacchaeus stood from the table and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, half of my goods I give to the poor, and if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I restore it fourfold. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house. Now, here's what we find. Jesus came to seek and to save. He wasn't just seeking Zacchaeus, but he came to save Zacchaeus. Now, how do we know that Zacchaeus is saved in this moment? We don't know all the conversation. You wish you knew the conversation that took place between Jesus and in Hebrew, his name is Zacchae, which is more fun to say, right? It sounds like it fits the wee little man, like Zacchae. Um, but you don't know the conversation. You, you don't know what took place, but something happened. Something happened to Zacchaeus. He was already seeking. His heart was already beginning to open and climbed up that tree. Now he hurries ahead of the crowd, gets everything prepared. Jesus shows up. And now we find that Zacchaeus' uh, heart has changed. For some reason, spending time with Jesus at his house changed his heart. How do we know that? We know it from Zacchaeus' behavior and Jesus' words. Zacchaeus' behavior and Jesus' words. Zacchaeus does two things. First, he says, uh, half of my goods I give to the poor. Half of my goods I give to the poor. So here we have a taker, chief tax collector, becoming a giver. That's a, that's a, that's a complete reversal. Now, uh, in fairness, the law, uh, a good Jew, if they are walking out the Torah, they cannot miss that over and over again it is repeated that they must take care of the poor. Take care of the poor. And we have the same thing in the New Testament. It doesn't go away this side of the cross. It's take care of the poor. Zacchaeus hadn't been taking care of the poor. Zacchaeus had been taking care of Zacchaeus. He was rich. And so he says, half my goods. That's half of everything that he has. He gives to the poor. And then he goes, so, so this taker becomes a giver. Something changed. And then the second thing he says, he tell, he, he, here in the text we find out that he says, anybody that I've defrauded or anything that I've defrauded, I, I will give back now four times. So imagine this. This is hypothetical, but imagine this. Imagine if Zacchaeus has stolen from you year after year after year. You don't like him. He, he shows up at your house after this encounter with Jesus and, and like with a ledger and is like, I've taken this much from you over this period of time. Now here's four times that back. Your life just changed financially. How do you respond to that? Well, this is Ebenezer Scrooge of Jericho, right? He's, he's everybody knows Ebenezer Scrooge, right? Not Nabataeans, but Ebenezer. We got Eb Ebenezer. Good. Anybody not know Ebenezer Scrooge? Do I need to tell the story? Christmas Carol. All that. Oh, we're good. Okay. So uh, he is that. He has changed completely. He has changed completely. So what if he shows up like that? How do you receive that? And how did he change like that? Why is his attitude different? And so here we find this encounter with Jesus changes Zacchaeus. He, he moves from being a taker to a giver. He moves from being a fraud to a restorer multiple times over. This is the mark of a man who has encountered a savior. And Jesus says, Luke 19, 9, today salvation has come to this house since he also is a son of Abraham. So he's not a son of Abraham that is getting saved by the Torah that day, saved by the law that day. Why? Because he's already broken so much of the law, there's no going back for this one. He's saved by grace, by the grace of Jesus, the fulfillment of the law, you see? And everything changes for him. Jesus came to seek and to save. And then the last part of verse 10 that we find is he, he came to save a particular kind of person, the lost. Again, Luke 19, 10, for the son of man, that's Jesus, came to seek and to save the lost. Now, this is a word, lost, that we don't like to deal with, use, admit. But lostness is a concept in the biblical scriptures from beginning to end that we must deal with. 
the truth of the matter is, if you know Jesus, you once were lost, but now you're found. Okay? So when you came to that moment that you confessed with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you believed in your heart, God raised him from the dead, you were saved according to the scripture. You once were lost, but now you're found. The problem is that sometimes people have been found so long they forget what it was like to be lost. And they lose heart for the ones that are, that are lost. I remember there was a time in, um, over the last, uh, it's maybe 10, 15 years ago now, that there was a time where sort of they were teaching, hey, don't use the word lost in your preaching. You know, use the word um, unchurched or whatever, because lost is offensive. Lost is offensive. It is offensive. You have to come to grips with the fact that you're lost before you are found. And unchurched doesn't mean the same thing. There are a lot of church people that are lost. How do you know if someone is found? Well, same with Zacchaeus. How do you know? I mean, it's one thing for Zacchaeus to say, I met, I, I met Jesus and I trusted him. It's another thing to see him like giving half of all his goods to the poor and restoring everybody he's defrauded. I mean, he's, he, he's not just asking them forgiveness. He's saying, forgive me and let me make it right as best I can. You know someone trusts Jesus when they walk like Jesus. Not because they said they're church or they're unchurched, not because their dad was a, a deacon or because even they're, they're, they have some role in the church or whatever, because they look like Jesus. They walk like Jesus. They trust him. And so they follow him. They hear him and they obey him. This is how you, this is how you know. This is how we know Zacchaeus is, is, is experiencing change because his behavior changed. Lost is a concept that we all need to get a hold of. We, we, before Jesus, were lost in the desert, like a lost sheep. The scriptures speak to this over and over again, Isaiah 53, verse six, speaking of Israel, but it, it pertains to us. It says, all we like sheep have gone astray. Like we're off the path. We, we don't know which way to go. We have turned everyone to his own way and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Now this is a verse about Jesus. The Lord has laid on him the iniquity, the sin of all of us. He has judged Jesus, the good shepherd. We are like sheep gone astray, but the good shepherd is the one who knows how to, to, to bring us back into the fold. He's the one who finds us. He's the one who seeks us. He's the, the one that changes our identity from lost to found. This is what happened with Zacchaeus today. That day as he encountered uh, Jesus. Psalm 119, 176. I have gone astray like a lost sheep. Seek your servant for I do not forget your commandments. This is the psalmist saying, look, sometimes I know who you are and sometimes I feel lost too. Like I've gone my own way. And sometimes you can know Jesus and, and simply walk away, walk away from him, quit listening to him, quit following him. Lostness is real. Being lost in the desert is, is not just a metaphor, but this is life. And so we need, to, we need uh, an, an encounter with Jesus. We need to, Jesus to sit at our table that we might change from being lost to found. The Bible describes any lostness like this, anyone who has not trusted Jesus for the forgiveness of sin, lost. Anyone who has not trusted Jesus for the forgiveness of sin. Second Peter chapter three, verse nine, the Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that anyone should perish. Yeah, have you ever asked yourself, maybe even in the last few months, like, Lord Jesus, why haven't you come back yet? This is, a, this is the worst it's ever been, which may or may not be true historically. 
he, does, he hasn't come back yet, not because he's not going to fulfill his promise, but because the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. He's patient that many might come to him, that many would come to him, that sinners would be forgiven. And lostness, the changing from being lost to found, only comes through Jesus. So when Zacchaeus climbed that tree that day and Jesus said, I'm coming to your house today and everything changed for Zacchaeus, we have to understand this about Jesus. He is a God who sits at the table of sinners. That is a radical concept. There is no other God you can find who sits at a table with sinners. Every other God says, well, if you do this and do this and do this and do this and do this, maybe you'll have enough good works and maybe I'll let you into whatever the version of heaven is, the Elysian fields, paradise, you name it. Jesus instead goes to the table of the sinner sits down in the mess and changes lives. This is what happened to me. It changed my life. If you're a follower of Jesus, you know this is what happened to you. If you came to know Christ, it is because of the grace of Almighty God. He looked up in that tree and he saw you. Don't forget Now, how do you respond to this? I mean, okay, Zacchaeus was a wee little man. You get it. It's not about Zacchaeus. It's about Jesus who came to seek and save the lost. And quite possibly there are people here in the room, online, watching. Quite possibly there are people that know about Jesus and are recognizing maybe for the first time their lostness. Because it's not enough to just know about Jesus. You have to trust Jesus. Everything that he said about himself and that he is, you have to choose to follow him. You confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. You believe. The word believe is the kind of belief that, that, that goes into your hands and your feet, not the kind of belief that we talk about in America, like I believe in this, that, or the other, and we, we make our perceptions true, but the kind of belief that, that says that Jesus, man, is God. He died on a cross to save me from my sin. He really did physically rise again from the grave. He ascended into heaven. He really is coming back. I believe it, and I will live accordingly. Not perfectly. When I sin, I repent but I will live his way. You know, it's that kind of belief. Maybe you're here and you you think to yourself, you're listening and think to yourself, like, I am so lost. My sin is so great. There's no way God could ever receive me. I want to tell you that that's wrong and a lie from the pit of hell. That Jesus is the one that looks up at the biggest sinner who climbed up in a tree and said, I'm coming to your house. So if that's you, if you know this in, in your gut, Right now, you're like, I, I feel this in my gut. I'm lost and I need Jesus. How do you respond to that? Like Zacchaeus, hurry. Hurry and let him in. Let him sit down and change your life. That begins in prayer. It's just telling him, there's no magic words. But just telling him, hey, I believe all that you said is true. I believe that you care about me, that you can forgive my sins. I can't rescue myself from my own sin. Forgive me. Change me. Maybe you need to respond like that because maybe you're, you're lost. But then maybe, possibly, there are many of us in this room who don't share the same passion for the lost that Jesus has. Maybe. It would be evidence in our behavior, not in our words. There'd be evidence in our behavior, like how do we love our neighbor? How do we love our enemy? How do we share the gospel? With words? Is it enough to serve every now and then, you know? Or do I I 
invite people, catch this a novel concept in the West, to sit at my table. People that don't agree with me or might not be a, a believer in Jesus or are different from me, or maybe be, or they're religious, but they just don't know Christ. <laughs> See, here's the step we need to take. Jesus goes through Jericho and makes a stop at the chief tax collector's house to seek and to save the lost. All of scripture teaches us that as disciples of Jesus, we walk like he walks. So I got to bet that he's put you in a place that, that, that is just as significant as Jericho every day as his ambassador. And I got to bet there are people around you who are lost. Can you list their names in your head? If not, you know their faces, but you don't know their name. Maybe the first thing you need to do is like, my name's Brian. Or depending on who they are. My name's Brian, or my name's Brian, my name's Brian. Whatever it is, you never know these days. It's hard. I know it's hard. But maybe you need to introduce yourself. Maybe you need to go out of your way to talk to them. Jesus did with Zacchaeus. Maybe... You should invite them into your own house to sit at your own table. There's no maybe about it. Maybe you should share food with them. And maybe you should share the gospel about how Jesus changed your life and the truth of it. You know, you're not responsible for how they respond. They might not like give everything they have and, you know, you're not responsible for that but to invite them at the table. And even if they say, I'm not really into Jesus now, keep eating and love them. That's your job. Share the love of Christ and the words of Christ with people in your workplace, your family, your neighborhood. You're there on purpose. The church of Jesus Christ in the United States of America wants to program this inside certain buildings, certain days of the week. And the plan is you out there every day. Biblically. See? So, Jesus sits at the table of sinners. Don't be part of the crowd that's frustrated with that. Make your table that kind of table, okay? Would you bow your head and close your eyes and uh, let's pray. Lord Jesus, forgive us when we have said, I don't even know how you could love someone like that. Forgive us when we have said, I don't have time to invest in that person. I don't even want to. Forgive us when we've been frustrated with you, when you've changed somebody's life that we don't like. Lord, give us your heart. Give us your desires to seek and to save the lost. Help us to be on mission as your followers. And for everyone, Father, that knows they're lost. Jesus, would you be that good shepherd in their life right now and just by your spirit, draw them to you. Give them the courage and the humility to confess their sins to you in prayer and to ask you to forgive them and cleanse them of all unrighteousness. God, give them the courage to trust you in faith and agree with you that you are Lord. Thank you for dying on a cross to save us from our sins. Thanks for every one of us that is a Zacchaeus that's been changed. We love you, Father. In Christ's name, amen.